This program is brought to you by Emory University. Welcome to our afternoon panel on privatized components of health law, medical practice, and health care. It was interesting for me to be invited to moderate this panel because only three years ago, the Thrower Symposium topic was the new New Deal from deregulation to re-regulation and the panel building a more responsive state addressed in part the growing reach of government regulation in healthcare. The fact that only three years later, and paradoxically after the largest government healthcare reform effort in my lifetime, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, or PPACA, the focus of this panel is privatization in healthcare. This demonstrates, I believe, not confusion amongst the Emory Law Journal, but the critical role relationships play um, between public, the critical role that uh, relationships between public and private entities play in healthcare delivery within the United States. In order to understand healthcare delivery and our, in quotations, healthcare system, it is important to first note that we do not actually have a single healthcare system in this country. Our alleged system is actually a patchwork of systems that operate together to affect cost, access, and quality of healthcare services. The primary actors of this patchwork of systems include both public and private regulators, institutions, payers, and providers. The purpose of this panel is to explore the public-private relationship between these actors. Specifically, the speakers will address two areas. First, governmental health functions contracted out to private parties. And second, the role of privatization in healthcare after PPACA, which was passed by Congress and signed into law by President Obama in 2010. Before I give you the specifics of what the panelists will discuss, I wanted to briefly tell you in general what PPACA does. This may be, in fact, the shortest summary ever provided. Uh, first, and this is by no means intended to be inclu uh, inclusive, um, it has a voluntary expansion of state Medicaid programs to cover the non-elderly adults 133% above the federal, po federal poverty level. It extends, second, the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP program, through 2019. Third, it increases private health care insurance market requirements, and we'll talk a lot about those today, including eliminating pre-existing condition exclusion clauses, requiring plans to provide, quote, essential benefits, and eliminating annual caps for those benefits. Fourth, it requires state establishment of health benefits exchanges with premium and cost sharing credits available for individuals 133 to 400 to 400 above the federal poverty level and to small businesses. Fifth, it establishes the individual mandate requiring individuals to purchase health care insurance. And last, it requires employers with more than 50 employees to offer coverage or pay a penalty and employers with uh, greater than 200 employees to automatically enroll their employees in insurance. So first, going back to the specific, uh, specifics of what the panelists will address, how government functions contracted out to private parties raises the question that the panelists will address, how has legal liability, specifically medical malpractice liability, affected contracts between public and private parties to provide medical services to public entities? With respect to the second uh, set of issues, the role that privatization will play after PPACA, the panelists will largely discuss how this remains unclear. 
as it is uncertain whether public law can in fact harness private incentives and how the privatized components will function in actuality. Uh, to my immediate right, Professor William Sage will provide an overview of the public-private tensions in healthcare competition, community health, health information technology, and medical liability. Next to him is sitting John Clarisi, who will focus on liability schemes the U.S. has employed, including the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Fund and the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness, or PREP Act, and their bearing on private firms. Next to John is Professor Catherine Zeiler, who will discuss the continued, in quotations, privatization of healthcare insurance coverage and why, in fact, it actually is not so private given current insurance structures and the problems that may arise from the public utility nature of the industry after PPACA. For example, the politicization of pricing, incentives to purchase more insurance than one needs, quote, off the book subsidies from low risk to high risk individuals, et cetera. By way of some biographical information from each, uh, for each of these uh, speakers, uh, Professor uh, William Sage is a national authority on health law and policy and is vice provost for health affairs and James R. Dowdy chair of faculty excellence at the University of Texas at Austin. Prior to that, he served as a professor at Columbia University and is currently a visiting professor at Yale Law School and is also taught at Harvard and Duke. Perhaps his uh, most famous credential, however, is he has been a mentor to me. <laughs> Professor Sage's scholarship focuses on healthcare reform, healthcare markets, patient safety, medical liability, healthcare information, and the ethics and regulation of health professionals. He is a member of a number of uh, institutes, including the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Sciences, uh, the Hastings Center on Bioethics. Um, and has, is a recipient of a number of grants, including an investigator award in health policy research. He has written over 125 articles or book chapters in the healthcare area. Uh, and he's a graduate of uh, Harvard College, uh, and his medical and law degrees were from Stanford University. John Clarisi is the founding partner of Tiber Creek Partners, LLC and a partner in the government contracts practice of McKenna, Long, and Aldrich. For over 13 years, he has been working on public health preparedness, including helping large pharmaceutical and emerging biotechnology companies develop creative approaches to accessing uh, capital uh, to deal with emerging disease and engineered threats. He has assisted over three dozen companies in obtaining nearly $4 billion in research uh, uh, research funding, including the majority of awards made under BioShield, the U.S. government's initiative for preparing the nation against a bioist, bioterrorist attack. He also has had a substantial uh, role in legislation, um, in drafting and passing the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness, or PREP Act, um, as well as uh, he played an instrumental role in uh, the uh, passage of the Biomedical Advanced Research and Developmental Authority, or BARDA Act. His JD is from North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and his undergraduate work was completed at Catholic University of America. Uh, Professor Kathy Zeiler teaches torts and economic analysis of healthcare law and co-directs the Georgetown Law and Economics Workshop. Her research focuses on healthcare law and economics, medical malpractice liability and insurance, disclosure regulation, experimental economics, and behavioral law and economics. She has both a PhD in economics from the California Institute of, Techno of Technology and a JD from the University of Southern California. She has visited NYU and Harvard, served as a senior academic fellow at Harvard School uh, Petrie Flom Center, and is a former member of the board of directors of the American Law and Economics Association and a member of the Max Planck Institute Scientific Review Board for Research on Collective Goods. She has a number of recent publications on medical malpractice liability. So without uh, further ado, uh, Professor William Sage.
Th thanks, Ani. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, extend my thanks to uh, all the folks who've been thanked by all the other uh, panelists. Uh, it was a great conversation this morning, and I actually learned a lot, and I also learned a lot about what the conference is about. So I took the opportunity this morning while I was listening to try to sketch out uh, a number of ways in which I think the uh, broad themes and some of the specific applications of privatization uh, apply to the healthcare system. So the healthcare system in the United States is huge. Uh, we're talking um, $3 trillion a year. That may not surprise you, but what might surprise you is that if you account for all of the direct payments and the indirect subsidies, more than half of that is public money. Which means that comparing us to the so-called socialized medicine countries of Western Europe, um, we spend the same amount of public money as any of them spend per capita, and then we add an equivalent amount of private money and end up with an extremely expensive and I would argue highly wasteful system, but a system that could best be described as a grudgingly public system of healthcare. Um, in this grudgingly public system of healthcare, Privatization is actually a very fluid and bi-directional process. There is no moment at which one decides to privatize or unprivatize American health care. Um, it keeps going back and forth in different ways and for different reasons. Um, U.S. health law is actually kind of similar. Um, it's a grudgingly public system of governance. Um, and it errs substantially in terms of empowering professions, in terms of uh, relying on self-regulatory rather than overtly regulatory processes. Um, and in keeping with some work I've done previously, um, it's a governance framework that very much emphasizes the relational, looking at an individual patient so denominated and an individual physician so denominated and their relationship and the way the larger system bears on that relationship rather than being kind of a regulatory collective um, exercise in governance. And I think that's extremely important to understanding these tensions between public and private and understanding some of the key challenges for the future. Uh, this is particularly good to talk about because in 2010, the country enacted uh, what I'll shorthand as the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and the Affordable Care Act is a very ambitious piece of legislation. And it's ambitious um, because of something that is absolutely true and seldom noticed. It has three very major parts. The first part, which is pretty much everything that Professor Satz described, is about health insurance. The second part isn't about health insurance, it's about the delivery of healthcare services, doctors, hospitals, stuff like that. And the third part's not health insurance or healthcare services, it's actually about health, underlying health of individuals and of communities. And the extraordinary ambition of the Affordable Care Act is it tries to do something simultaneously in each of these domains that would be an improvement uh, over current circumstances. Where does it fall short? It falls short um, because it actually, in doing all of these things, never truly asserts a collective interest in healthcare, the sort of collective interest you think would accompany um, an a proudly public system rather than a grudgingly public system. So now let me just spend a little bit point of time, and I don't have enough to do this justice, but I'll uh, highlight a few things within each of these three headings that um, encapsulate the public and private tensions. And again, it's fluid, it's bi-directional, it's not always a privatization story, uh, but there's a lot of impulses involved. So first let's talk about the notion of public health insurance in this country, which to our ears doesn't sound quite right. So why is so much of our health insurance nominally private, though um, very much publicly supported and constrained? Uh, number one reason, fiscal politics. We have a healthcare system that runs from individuals to healthcare providers largely via private employers who provide health insurance as a fringe benefit of employment and private insurance companies. Now, in upholding the Affordable Care Act against constitutional challenge, the um, Chief Justice wrote this penalty for not buying private health insurance is a tax. 
and therefore is constitutionally valid. He didn't write all the money flowing through these private health insurers is actually a tax. The whole mandate to buy health insurance is actually a tax. He didn't do that. Back in 1994, the Congressional Budget Office did that with the proposal that the Clinton administration offered and the prospect of an instant trillion dollar increase in taxation and government spending was enough to kill the legislation. So we have a private healthcare system in part because of fiscal politics. We also have a, an uncomfortably private healthcare system because of concerns over insurability. This is Title I of the Affordable Care Act. Um, in a really private health insurance system, if you're uninsurable, you don't get to participate. For a lot of reasons, our system's not comfortable with that, and in the Affordable Care Act, we finally placed sufficient restrictions on private health insurance underwriting such that that aspect of insurability no longer matters to access to health insurance in this country, public-private tension. Another time, curiously, we go to the private is actually to improve access. So back in the 1990s, there was a lot of experimentation with managed care, both in explicitly private and explicitly public insurance domains, uh, and in the latter, both Medicare and Medicaid. Medicaid, of course, being for categories of indigent Americans. Why were so many poor people put into Medicaid managed care in the 1990s, you might think it was to save the government money. That actually is not true. It was done to give poor people access to a reliable source of care other than a hospital emergency room because an insurance system could provide that, but individual physicians' offices accepting or not accepting Medicaid patients on a discretionary basis and locating themselves accordingly in a geographic sense would not. So there we went from the public Medicaid system to a private Medicaid managed care system for a totally different reason, actually to improve access to basic health care for the poor. Um, sometimes also in that era, why did we go from nominally public to nominally private? Well, we thought the private side would be able to ration care in ways that politically speaking, um, the public system or legally speaking, the public system couldn't. Um, they didn't ration care. It was interesting to see whether the rationing that they might be allowed to do would be done transparently, which is how it started, or secretly, which was how it ended, and why did it end in secret? It ended in secret because when they did it transparently, we didn't like it as the public, and we made our legislatures pass laws against doing it in public. Um, and we went from private from public to private health insurance in the 1990s because we thought those private managed care companies would solve the problem of hurting cats. And by cats, of course, I mean the medical profession. Uh, trying to get physicians to actually change the way they practice medicine was not something a public system was capable of doing. So let's switch over a little bit from public insurance to sort of public health services. And that also doesn't sound right. You know, we don't think of the U.S. as public health care services. But indeed, we have these same sorts of tensions between public and private in many different domains. Um, we like the idea of private health care systems, of uh, services, strangely enough, in part because we like the idea of charity. And we've created not-for-profit community institutions, largely hospitals, that have a charitable mission, and we've reinforced what we perceived as the charitable ethical impulses of the medical profession. Um, and we've invested very heavily in this private system, only to find that sometimes our private non-for-profit hospitals don't really do that much charity, or even when they do, what they mainly represent, writ large, is a systematic collective provision of resources to private physicians who can go at no cost to themselves and avail themselves for patient benefit of these hospital staff, hospital facility, hospital equipment, and use those. But the impulse there between public and private was compromised in this notion of charitable, private, but not for profit. Um, we go in healthcare services, obviously, towards the private because we think it reinforces professionalism, both the professional expertise and the professional ethics that a directly governmental system would not. Um, and we do this beyond individual professionals. We do this 
um, to the level of how we govern even our very large institutions, which are governed through largely self-regulatory accreditation mechanisms that are really not ultimately a function of government explicitly, but are a function of the aggregate of many of the professions and health facilities that they themselves control. Um, so the Joint Commission, as it's now called, really the most powerful regulator of hospitals in the country is not a regulator of hospitals. It's a self-regulator of hospitals comprised of hospital interests and physician interests. Um, you might think for healthcare services that we keep things private because private healthcare is more competitive. Um, given the incentives we've created and given largely the constraints that government, and not government over there, some evil force, but government, all of us, the things that we've asked for and worried about and demanded over decades and close to a century, because of all those things government has done, we actually don't let private health care providers compete, except in very narrow ways. Um, we're very good at having competition over new stuff new types of drugs and devices and the like, we're very bad at having competition over price and competition over accessibility and convenience and reorganization of how everybody works together to provide healthcare services. And then I guess for the last domain, um, let's talk about um, instead of public health insurance, which doesn't sound right, or public healthcare services, which definitely doesn't sound right, how about public health? Well, public health sounds really right. Um, it would surprise you to know that that's where a lot of the action around privatization is actually likely to take place. Um, we're now talking about the things beyond healthcare services and health insurance that make people and communities healthy. Um, one issue that's gone to the private side is that our healthcare system is very short term and highly fragmented. And so we somehow think that by defragmenting, by empowering large integrated systems, certain versions perhaps of accountable care organizations to serve broad communities, that they will be able to combine the very technical familiar health care with something closer to community health and do it with a long-term view that traditional insurance companies who sell annually and people change policies don't have, and for some reason government, which should have the long-term view, doesn't have either. But we think that perhaps by um, empowering these private organizations to um, establish networks and communities that they will actually invest in the long-term health of the people. So it's a privatized public health function. And we have um, similar impulses um, around even more basic kind of public goods of health education and reserve capacity. And interestingly, for people who are interested in tax law, and particularly tax exemption law applied to hospitals, the Affordable Care Act um, renders much less important as justification for tax exemption the provision of charitable services, because so many people are now within funded insurance programs but renders much more important to justify that institutional tax exemption, doing something more broadly in the community, and that thing more broadly in the community is much more likely to be about improving the underlying health of the community. Um, and finally, uh, we're gonna see a lot of emphasis over the next few years in improving people's behaviors insofar as they're currently unhealthy and could become healthier. And improving behaviors is going to have to do with incentives, financial and non, and various types of constraints, including constraints on exposure to the marketing messages of all the people who would render you less healthy than you might otherwise choose to be. Um, done by government, these things run smack into the First Amendment done by private organizations, um, considerably less so. And there's going to be a lot of action, I think, around the privatization, if you will, of public health. So let me leave you um, there. It's not a clean story, but it's an interesting one, and most of it's yet to be written. Um, what would I say are really the number one and number two goals for healthcare 
whether it's public or private. Number one, going back to what Francis McGovern was saying and quoting Clay Christensen, um, yes, in healthcare, even more so than in legal process, uh, we have had better, much more expensive, and considerably less accessible care over the course of decades. Um, right now, it's really pretty simple. Acute and complex healthcare needs to be quicker, cheaper, and more reliable. Basic care that now either doesn't happen or happens only for the privileged few who happen to wander into a physician's office or a clinic, um, basic care needs to be more convenient and more integrated with people's everyday lives. So we're not talking about patients anymore in the basic world of health. We're just talking about people. And I don't know what combination of private or public interventions and governance structures is likely to get us there. But if we don't have a quicker, cheaper, more reliable healthcare system that is better integrated in a health producing way uh, with people's lives, uh, we might as well give up. So thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation, and it's an honor to be here, particularly among these wonderful speakers and in the audience. I'm going to take a different tack from, I think, what you've heard thus far and do more of a case study than a specific um, lecture or thought piece about what could happen. And there's a couple of things that are unusual about the story that I'm going to describe, and, and one that jumps out of the box is that the the issue that I'm going to describe is one where the government ceded willingly, encouragingly, a function of essentially public health and national security to industry based on a recognition that the government itself knew that it could not do it effectively, efficiently, and in a timely manner in the way that the private sector could. Now, as Dan Gordon's in the audience, that happens all the time uh, with outsourcing and different various uh, mechanisms. But what's really unusual in this case is it's something that the government does every day, and it's a portion of healthcare. It is a business that they're already in, yet this particular point they carved out. And uh, what I'm going to describe, and it was mentioned a little bit in my, um, my biography that was, that was said, is what happened after the anthrax attacks. And the need of the federal government to respond to the anthrax attacks and create an incentive to encourage the private sector to respond and make treatments and therapeutics for diseases that we knew about but hadn't had the pleasure of experiencing and diseases we don't know about. And, and SARS is a perfect example of things that are going to happen, whether the terrorists do it or not, that we need to be prepared for. So if, if you think right after 9-11 and, and October of that year when the anthrax attacks happened, and uh, think about the lines of people looking for anthrax vaccine, looking for ciprofloxin, and the government's response to it, uh, poor at first in terms of not even knowing the source of the attacks, um, or that it was a terrorist attack, the source of the disease, but then also understanding what it did in response. And uh, the first foray that, that the government, the royal government, took into addressing this issue actually came from Congress. It was not the administration that led on this issue. It was Senator Joe Lieberman and Senator Warren Hatch introduced a piece of legislation in March of 2002 with the objective of creating a biodefense industry, of creating an incentive for companies, pharmaceuticals and biotechs, to get into a business where the government's their customer and they're making drugs and vaccines for diseases that either don't exist, like smallpox, or that we don't want to ever use. And how do you do that? What are the incentive mechanisms? It wasn't only the smallpox or the uh, anthrax attack itself, it was the intelligence that followed that that also set the stage for this. In 2002, early 2002, there were briefings to Congress by the administration that were very, very concerned about a pending smallpox attack upon the United States. There was intelligence that saw former uh, Soviet scientists that were, I've seen the pictures, they were in Iraq. Uh, their, their weapons may not have been there, but they were there, and it set off a, a fear of how you do it. And the government, at that point, uh, acquired through donation enough, enough, enough smallpox vaccine for every man, woman, and child in the United States. That's the good news. The bad news is that vaccine was 50 years old. Uh, we eradicated smallpox in uh, 1978 and had not vaccinated the United States since the mid-60s. It was made from cow pus, and I use those words to get the effect I'm wanting. Um, it was an old vaccine, but it worked. And, and Wyeth and uh, Venice donated that to the government. 
what do you do with the fact that, that these pharmaceutical companies that have shareholders are not, are not public entities, uh, have to respond to donating a 50-year-old vaccine that's going to be used in every man, woman, and child in the event of a smallpox attack? Liability is an issue for those guys. Um, and, and the first uh, step along that journey was the government has the authority, and it comes from the War Powers Act, believe it or not, uh, to indemnify contractors that engage in ultra-hazardous activity, to essentially back them with unlimited insurance and say, we will step in your shoes if you get sued. It's called Public Law 85804. And that statute had been used many times over 50 years for things like rocket launches, uh, the space shuttle, testing nuclear bombs. Never before it had been used um, necessarily in, in a national emergency was relating to a bioterrorist event. So the first thing that happened right after 9-11 and in the wake of the smallpox intelligence and, the wait, and, the, and these donations from the private sector was the government entered into an indemnity agreement under Public Law 8504 and said, we're going to indemnify you, Venice and Wyeth, if we have to use this vaccine and plaintiffs are created. That was the good news. Uh, soon thereafter, the, the administration, and particularly the Office of Management and Budget, woke up to say, oh my God, what have we done? We have just taken on an unlimited contingent liability in perpetuity. Uh, and, and this is not the only time they used it. They also used it for anthrax sensors, they used it for devices, everything else was being deployed. And Mitch Daniels, who was then the director of OMB, woke up, I imagine, screaming in his sleep, saying, what have we done? And he sent out an edict and said, never again. Stop using 85804. We can't take on this contingent liability. It'll bankrupt the country five times over. What are we supposed to do? At the same time, I mentioned Senator Lieberman and Senator Hatch are encouraging industry to enter this business, creating incentives, putting out a $10 billion fund to get people into the business. So you're putting a carrot out here, but you're not addressing what the obstacle is to success. And uh, the issue of liability um, and how Congress could deal with it became to the forefront. Now, the issue of vaccine liability is not new. Uh, the, the Vaccine for Children's program, which is administered right down the street at the CDC, has been in existence for many years. And Judge Kaczynski sat on the Court of Claims and knows vaccine injury claims and, 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 the, and the course that, that that takes. That is a way that the government has dealt with vaccine injury, but it's done it through a private partnership where the, where the, where the um, companies pay into a fund that will compensate victims. In return for that, liability is capped. Um, if they choose that, that route of administration. They can still go to the courts, the traditional courts, but if they go through the compensation scheme, uh, liability is capped. Why does that not work in the area of bioterrorism? It doesn't work for a couple reasons. It's not so much the vaccine liability, because proving that these companies create did negligence is a relatively hard standard, and there's been lots of claims around autism and other places where injuries have been claimed. It's a very high standard to meet. But the lawsuits themselves, if every man, woman, and child has a cause of action against a pharmaceutical company, simply filing a summary judgment motion would bankrupt those companies if they had to do it in every court in the country and against it. So the idea of a, of a compensation scheme based upon the Vaccine for Children's program or other mechanisms really didn't work. And it also had been tried in the 70s when there was a swine flu epidemic and uh, did not work particularly well then either. So that was not an option. So what industry was then left with in 2000, 2003 time frame is a choice. Do we make Mitch Daniels' worst nightmare and have the United States become an ultra insurer of every liability, or do we do tort reform? Uh, remember who was president in 2002. Remember where he came from. Uh, Texas is, is, is still today the leading tort reform state, and certainly President Bush, Governor Bush, were the main proponents of tort reform. Uh, this led to a very interesting split in the industry, and the industry uh, wanted, liability, wanted uh, indemnity for obvious reasons. The general counsels of the large companies wanted indemnity. They didn't want to have to defend these cases. They didn't believe that tort reform could be passed federally. They didn't believe that it could be passed in a way that was solid enough that would actually protect them from claims. They didn't believe that Congress wouldn't repeal it when there was a change of administrations and the Democrats took over and had a chance to, they didn't believe any of that. Um, the only problem with that is indemnity with a Republican president Republican Senate and a Republican House and a Republican Senate for partial of the time was a non-starter, and the White House made that very clear. They were not about to sign up to insuring pharmaceutical companies, um, and also the politics of that don't sound particularly interesting either. What ultimately came about is Project BioShield passed in 2004, and that created the carrot, $5.6 billion to create vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics to treat and detect bioterrorism. The liability protections did not pass. About the same time, the country began preparing 
for what was observed as a potential influenza pandemic out of Southeast Asia, H5N1. And if the uh, nine deaths from air, air anthrax in 2001 caused the country to grind to a halt, a event similar to what occurred in 1918 when a flu pandemic hit the, hit the world and hit the United States um, motivated the government to do something because there was a tremendous fear that such a pandemic could hit. Again, this is mother nature. This isn't the bad guys. There's only so much we can do about this. The issue of liability was identical. You had the flu manufacturing capability solely in the hands of industry. That's relatively new. States used to make vaccines. State public health officials used to make vaccines. In fact, in some states, they still do. That was all privatized during the course of the 60s, 70s, 80s, and all the way to the 90s. The state of Michigan privatized uh, their company that made anthrax vaccine for the country in 1997, just a few years before 9-11. So no longer was the vaccine manufacturing capability hands, in the hands of the government. The government also contemplated creating what was called a government-owned contractor-run facility, a GOCO and looked at what, how that would work and how the government can make these critical countermeasures on its own dime. And they reviewed that, and that didn't work either, particularly in a, type, uh, in, a, in a president that was very much focused on the private sector and not wanting to impugn industry. What ultimately came out was the PREP Act. And the PREP Act was both a political uh, firestorm, if you actually look on Wikipedia, it's described as the highly controversial PREP Act. Um, and if you read the law, and, and I'm gonna read you a provision of it in a second, you'll see that it is, in my view, the most far-reaching tort reform passed not only at the state level, but also at the federal level, given the breadth of its protections. And it came about because of a opportunity in time where the government asked the private sector to do something that was really a government function and chose not to do it. Sounds familiar with some of the things we're talking about here today. But in return for that, the government passed a statute that said, we're gonna immunize you, pharmaceutical companies. And I'm gonna read this directly. For any claim or loss that has a causal relationship with the administration or use of a medical countermeasure, including causal relationship with, get ready, the design, the development, clinical testing, investigation, manufacturing, labeling, distribution, formulation, packaging, marketing, promotion, sale, purchase, donation, dispensing, prescribing, administration, licensing, or use of such countermeasure. I challenge anyone in the room to find the hole in that. Because uh, some of us sat in a room with a whiteboard and thought of every possible thing that could happen in the, in the supply chain and said, how can we take out that liability and remove it? And that's what, that's what got embedded in the PREP Act. The other aspect of the PREP Act, which is extraordinary, is it creates a single cause of action. So if these things are used and there are injuries, a single cause of action will be created. It'll be vested in a single court, the District of Columbia. There'll be a three-judge panel and panel to hear this. The bar for negligence has been raised where you have to establish um, wrongful purpose or, or intentional, um, intentional acts in order to even bring the case. You can't claim central negligence. And it specifically says that the law shall not be construed to entertain uh, basic negligence as a claim. If you succeed in bringing the case, you get no punitive damages. You get only compensatory damages. So you've just taken the incentive out from the trial bar to ever bring that case um, because they only get a third of, the, of the, the ruling. And if you bring the case and you fail, you get mandatory Rule 11 sanctions. So uh, it was a fairly large challenge to the trial bar into ATLA, and uh, they didn't like it very much. Um, there's lots of stories I probably won't have time to get into in terms of how the sausage was made and these things you're not supposed to talk about in Washington. The bill was actually voted down by a committee um, as it was going into the defense appropriations bill. Uh, Speaker Hastert and Senator Frist heard about it, took the bill, stapled it literally to the back of the bill before it went to the floor of the House over the objections of the committee and it became law, signed by President Bush in December of 2005. So not only the drafting of it was complicated, but also the, um, the passage of it was very complicated and something that will never happen again. So remember one of the things I said that the industry was concerned about is what happens when a Democratic president comes in? What happens when a Democratic Congress comes in? That didn't take too long to happen. So. 2008, President Obama is elected. One of his first item agendas in the first 100 days was repeal of the, of the PREP Act. That was on his agenda, his first 100-day agenda. And obviously, the, the Democrats had both houses. What happened? Something very simple happened. In March of 2009, a novel version of the H1 virus was detected in Mexico. And thus began the pandemic, uh, flu pandemic of 2009. And uh, the opponents of the PREP Act uh, realized that this thing that was an aberration, that was a, putting a trust in industry, was the only way possible that flu vaccine was gonna be provided to the American people in urgency. And Secretary Sebelius signed and has put into effect nine declarations under the PREP Act 
triggering its protection. Um, and there is no chance it'll be repealed, at least under the current administration. They view it as something that was critical to their response to the 2009 pandemic and is critical to preparing the nation against the national uh, emergency. In closing, as we, as we talk about the Affordable Care Act, what does this mean? Well, as has already been mentioned, the Affordable Care Act is going to impose all kinds of obligations upon private companies. And my point in telling the story about the PREP Act is to really understand the unknown consequences of when you bring the private entities in to do something which is somewhat of a government function but also try to be done in partnership. Where is it going to stop? Where is it going to start? I'll give a specific example where this has come to fruition already. In July of 2012, the uh, Inspector General of Health and Human Services issued a report and they did an analysis of the Vaccines for Children's program and looked at the vaccines that have been distributed under that program and where the supply chain goes. These are vaccines provided by every major vaccine company, paid for in a federal government contract issued by the CDC with all the federal acquisition regulations applying to it in normal. And the distribution is handled by a very responsible company, another Atlanta-based company, McKesson. Um, so everything was done right. Even with that, the IG found that 20% of the vaccines administered to children under this program have fallen out of spec which means that they are either too hot or too cold, and the viability of those vaccines are questioned. They're essentially giving adulterated product to children, and that program is specifically funded by Medicaid. This is an example of what if the consequences are. What are the consequences to the vaccine injury compensation fund that was set up? What are the consequences to the litigation path through the court of claims to challenge vaccine injury? Is vaccine injury including Today it was announced uh, that pertussis, whooping cough, um, may be traced back to a novel version of, of, the, of the, the bug causing it. Other people speculate it's because the whooping cough vaccine that's being administered is ineffective because it's falling out of cold chain, pertussis. What is the liability to the federal government? What is the liability to the manufacturers in this public-private partnership? And does another PREP Act have to happen to address that? As we look forward to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, all of these issues are going to have to be confronted with the shifted role of the public-private partnership between industry and government, and how do you manage these unknown liability challenges. My example of the PREP Act says how you can do it in the face of an emergency, um, where you have the political uh, weight on your side. Going forward, I think it's a big question to how it, how it gets addressed and something that everyone in this room needs to think about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to start by congratulating the, the journal staff and board um, for picking a, a really timely and interesting topic and assembling such an esteemed group of panelists. I'm really honored to be among them. And I um, want to thank you very much for the invitation to come and, and talk to you about what I've been thinking about lately. Um, and thanks to, of course, to the Thrower family. I think it's hard um, when you're outside of academia to get a sense of the benefits of these kinds of conferences. This kind of conference where we come together for one day, there are a number of speakers and um, people thinking about the same sorts of issues can have huge impacts on the research that's done in these areas. And so these conferences are, are hugely important for us as researchers to get together and, and talk to each other about what sorts of ideas we're thinking about and how, and to cross pollinate, to think about um, you know, how, how issues in ch charter schools can impact issues in pr privatization of prisons. So, um, so the, I think the money the Thrower family is spending is absolutely worth spending. Um, so my comments are unrelated to liability, even though that's one of my main areas of research. Um, I'm going to instead focus on um, the continued privatization, uh, I hate these air quotes, but I'm going to use them a lot in my talk, um, of healthcare insurance coverage. Um, which is a good that I think many uh, wish the government would directly provide to everyone, sort of a Canadian-style um, system or the traditional Canadian-style system. So my argument is that in contrast to the description by many um, of the Affordable Care Act solution to the access problem as a private market solution, it's anything but a private market solution. Instead. I'll argue that the Affordable Care Act will turn private insurers into something like public utilities and that's, that this likely will lead to a number of um, troublesome issues that we'll need to deal with or at least debate 
some of which arise because the government has chosen to privatize one of its main functions, which is the subsidization of, um, of health care for consumers with high expected costs who might not be able to afford insurance and health care. Um, so during uh, my talk, I'm going to lay out um, the basic contours of what a private market would look like. And of course, given all of the market imperfections of private insurance markets, um, we can't leave them completely private. So we have to do some kind of regulation. I'm going to call it smart regulation. Um, and uh, so I'm going I'm to think about, I'm going to try to sketch out what a smartly regulated private insurance market might look like. And then I'm going to talk about the ways in which the Affordable Care Act deviates from that baseline. And I'll finish with issues that might arise when, when the government tries to use private markets um, to achieve government functions. So I'm going to talk a lot about the uninten unintended consequences that were mentioned before. Um, so I'm going to start with the assumption that our goal is to ensure access to care, control costs, and optimize um, the quality of care. So that triad, I think I learned first from, from Bill Sage, who uh, I'm proud to say is one of my mentors as well. I think he's had a major impact on everybody who's uh, working in health law today. Um, so uh, let me start by sketching out what the private market might uh, for, he for health insurance might look like. So one, insurers would be able to decide with whom to contract. They could sell to anyone regardless of the consumer's state of residency. They could decide how much to charge for insurance. They would be allowed to gather information about expected losses and set prices according to expected losses in a way that's similar to how prices are set in other sorts of insurance markets like auto insurance. They could decide all the terms of the contract and offer a variety of different contract types according to demand in the market. So different um, individuals will, would demand different types of plans with different types of coverage. Um, and they would be able to, to offer these. And they would be able to keep all the profits they earn. Consumers would be able to find a contract that includes only the type of coverage they de desire. They would be allowed to pool themselves with like risks. So low risk folks would be able to pool themselves with other low risk folks. And the high risk folks um, would pool themselves together. Um, we would be able to go without insurance if we chose to, um, and we'd be able to shop for insurance in a robust private market um, that's not put at a disadvantage by distortionary tax breaks um, for the purchase of insurance through employers. So scrap employer-sponsored insurance, scrap the tax break for purchase of insurance. Now, what's the role of the government here? So the government could step in um, to, to regulate with an effort toward correcting market imperfection. So the, the government could resolve con contract breach claims. So if an insurer promised something that wasn't delivered, um, the government could step in to address the breach claim. The government could be uh, helpful in applying antitrust regulations to reduce market power at all levels, at the insurance company level, at the provider level. Um, they might regulate to ensure the solvency of insurers. Um, to provide direct subsidies to those who cannot afford insurance and, and health care um, to correct for positive externalities. So this is something we might think of as a market imperfection. So there are certainly some of us um, whose happiness uh, depends upon uh, the, the access, uh, the level of access that people uh, have to the health care system. So to the extent that the government has any role at all in addressing these sorts of positive externalities, um, the government would directly subsidize the, the cost of insurance, the price, uh, uh, the purchase of insurance, and also the purchase um, of care. So we would not need rules to force hospitals to treat in emergency situations, but we might need a way to monitor to prevent fraud and abuse. Um, and maybe um, the government might have a role in providing incentives through tort law to keep providers and insurers in line. So this might entail um, changing ERISA legislation that, um, to make it possible for consumers to um, recover consequential damages from employer-sponsored insurers, which we wouldn't have. But any, any limit on liability um, for consequential damages would be removed. 
Um, and this might entail changing the standard of care from, for medical malpractice generally from custom, which it is now, um, to another standard that might better align the interests of patients and providers, which is um, one of the goals of medical malpractice liability. The government might also, this is debatable, help consumers obtain the information they need to make good choices for themselves. So I say maybe here because in, uh, when there are information uh, asymmetries or information problems, a lot of times the market will, will provide the information. So when information is demanded, we can sometimes rely on the market to provide the information that's required. Um, so, so, for example, one feature of insurance contracts that's important for consumers to understand is the methods that insurers use to pay uh, providers. Okay, so that's, um, that's what a, uh, some features of a smartly regulated uh, insurance market look like. So what does the Affordable Care Act's private market solution look like? Well, um, under the Affordable Care Act, consumers um, must purchase insurance or face a penalty. So it's not a mandate, that, right? The Supreme Court has clarified for us that the Affordable Care Act does not mandate the purchase of insurance, but it imposes a simple Pagovian tax that's meant to encourage purchase. Um, some employers have to offer insurance or face a penalty. Um, and, we're, and we're left with the distorting tax benefits that encourage the purchase of insurance um, through our employers. Um, insurers cannot turn anyone away, um, and all costs uh, must be covered, even known costs, so pre-existing conditions. So insurance companies now are not just insurance companies, they're also, um, they also cover costs that are known, right? That there's no risk at all, they're just known costs. All policies um, sold must comply with essential benefit standards and cost-sharing restrictions, so the contracts have to look a particular way and offer particular kinds of benefits. Um, there are incentives to form what are called accountable care organizations, which um, uh, some believe might consolidate the market power of, um, uh, consolidate uh, provider, the provider market, um, which will lead to, to the standard problems we get um, from market power. In fact, a new empirical study just came out, one of the first um, showing that prices are in fact higher in markets with um, early affordable, uh, accountable care organization penetration. Insurers must refund excessive profits um, to consumers. So insurers have to face downside risk but cannot enjoy upside risk. Prices will be heavily scrutinized and regulated, so insurers must pool the risk of all employees and all plans except grandfathered plans, so some, some get out. Um, so the implication here is that insurers are not allowed to price based on risk, uh, a risk, um, the expected loss of each individual. Prices are allowed to vary only for variation in family composition, geography, actuarial value the benefits. So if the, if the policy looks different, the price can be different age and tobacco use um, up to a certain extent, and insurers who are selling in the individual market who are able to attract lower than average risks um, will be forced to make payments to insurers who end up with the higher than average risks. Okay, so very, I think that's been an under-publicized uh, feature of this act. Um, and then, uh, there are some things that seem uh, better in line with government function. So there are premium credits and cost-sharing subsidies for those who, um, who are deemed unable to afford insurance. So we have direct subsidies. Um, and also um, the governments are going to, at least some of them, are going to organize health insurance exchanges which will aid consumers in choosing plans that best fit their needs. So in terms of providing information to consumers and helping them shop for plans, this. Um, this is a good, uh, a good feature of the, of the Affordable Care Act. But the plans that will be sold through the exchanges will be heavily regulated um, along the dimensions of price, profits, benefits, et cetera. And private insurers will have to compete with a public plan option. Um, we heard Sasha talking about the benefits of these. I think one of the things we have to consider when we're thinking about um, a public uh, entity competing with private enterprise is that um, if the government is backing you up 
um, you can re you can operate at a loss um, for many many years, right? See the Postal Service <laughs> or Amtrak. Um, private entities cannot do this; they are going to drop out of the market. Um, so that that puts private entities at a, at a really strong disadvantage um, in terms of competing um, with a with a sort of a an entity that has an endless supply of of funds. Um, so, so I want to talk uh, uh, with my last few remaining minutes about um, the potential problems that might arise from the transformation of private insurance into um, what I'm terming public utility. Um, the first is the politicization of prices. Um, so a few years back, I did some work for the state of New York. Um, so they called uh, some medical malpractice experts in um, to try to get them out of a crisis. And the crisis um, happened um, because the medical malpractice insurers in New York all were facing um, uh, substantially low reserves. So. Um, so they were worried about solvency, and uh, we started talking about you know what what was going on, how how might this have happened? So in order to solve a problem, you have to figure out I think what caused it. So we asked a lot of questions, and we what we discovered was that in New York, the doctors um, were putting a lot of pressure on legislators um, to keep insurance prices low. And every time an insurer would ask for a rate increase, um, the state would say no, no, sorry. Um, and uh, losses exceeded premiums, and when that happens, um, the insurance companies have to eat into their reserves, eat into their reserves, and uh, it had gotten to the point where reserves were, were at such a low rate that um, they were thinking about tort reform um, as a way to, to uh, you know, further reduce uh, uh, the cost of litigation. Um, we've seen this already. Uh, there's an example in Connecticut, I think not too long ago, Connecticut Department of Insurance um, uh, approved a double-digit rate increase for one of its health insurers, um, and, and Sibelius, you know, uh, Secretary Sibelius got on the line and said, hey, you know, what are you guys doing up there? Why are you approving this huge rate increase? Um, and the state pulled back. So it's hard to say, um, you know, whether that rate increase was justified or not. You have to take a look at the financial uh, um, uh, position of the insurer to know what kind of rate increase um, they're going to need and also what their future costs look like, um, how their pools might have changed given, given um, high, high unemployment rates and, and people dropping out of, of insurance markets. Um, but the fact that that uh, I think insurance companies are uh, have become sort of a pariah, um, I think uh, we're going to be in trouble um, uh, when we think about insurance companies trying to set prices to to cover their costs. So it's unclear really whether insurers um, will be able to even survive um, in this market. Um, even with the incentives individuals will have to purchase insurance, which I think is why they were um, for it, um, they were gonna, they're going to get a lot, a lot more customers. Um, but this, the Supreme Court's decision, uh, recent decision, gives Congress less power to increase the penalty to encourage more people to participate in the market. Now we have sort of a, you know, can't get too high, or you're going to, it's going to be a mandate, and that's uh, that violates uh, Commerce Clause power. So. Um, so that's problem number one. The second one uh, is that because of the way um, insurance companies have to price insurance and the, and the fact that they can't think about risk um, at all, and in fact if they're able to attract uh, low risk, they have to pay uh, some amount to high risk pools. Um, that is going to result in, in what I call a, a, I think, what will be a huge um, off the books um, transfer. So it's a subsidization um, that's happening through the insurance market um, rather than us, so we could do it another way. We could pay money to the government in the form of taxes and the government could then provide additional subsidies um, to, to the, the high risk people who are gonna get these subsidies now in, instead through the insurance market. Um, so what's the, what's the big deal? One route rather than the other? Well, the, I think the problem is that it's, um, because it's off the books, one, it's not subject to the PAYGO rules, um, and so there's gonna be no debate really about um, how, you know, how much and, uh, and when we should stop. 
but it's, it's also going to be really difficult to, um, and maybe impossible, to measure the relative benefits and costs. And when we think about you know, what we want to spend our tax dollars on, um, it's going to be really difficult to include this as something that we're paying for um, because the, the payment is sort of being made uh, under the table and through the markets. So just to wrap up, um, I think what's going to happen in the, in the coming years, health economists and others are going to be working on studying the pros and cons of the Affordable Care Act's transformation of the private insurance market into public utilities. And these issues, I think, will certainly be on the agenda. So stay tuned. Thank you. Hey, I'd like to give uh, the panelists an opportunity to respond to each other, if they would like, first, before we open or up for questions. OK. Uh, We'd love to hear from you then. Good afternoon. My question is mainly for Professors uh, Sage and Professor Zeiler. Uh, you both kind of touch on the fact that there seems to be a conflict between the way that uh, the government is uh, formulating its public and private partnerships in healthcare. And Professor Zeiler, you touch on antitrust law a little bit. Uh, Professor Sage, you mentioned that the government does not allow healthcare providers to compete on price and accessibility. And that made me think of the cases in which the federal government issues antitrust enforcement actions against hospital associations that the state charters, such as the Phoebe Putney case right now that's going up before the Supreme Court. And I just wanted to ask if you were having, um, if in your opinion you believe that this was sort of an inefficient division of labor in the way that the government approaches private, part, uh, private and public partnerships, both at the federal level and at the state level. Well, um, so I keep forgetting I, I've arrived in Georgia where the Phoebe Putney case is obviously of more than passing interest. Um, so the Phoebe Putney case is framed as a question of state action immunity under the federal antitrust laws. Um, I'm not going to make a prediction about outcome, but I think there's a more general phenomenon that I think is extremely important. Um, we all would acknowledge that we think vigorous competition um, helps consumers, helps efficiency in the long term, assists innovation. I don't think any of us seriously questions that. Um, but American antitrust law applied to healthcare uh, tends to uh, make certain assumptions about the existing market structure and the dimensions along which competition currently occurs as being the result of largely private competitive processes and therefore good, rather than is, in the, is the fact in healthcare being the product of a whole lot of regulation, self-regulation, and tradition taking place over a century or more. And um, the Phoebe Putney case is unfortunate in some sense because it's going to render a judgment on a specific principle of antitrust interpretation which says that if a state um, clearly articulates and actively supervises a substitute for competition, the federal antitrust laws won't stand in a way. What the Phoebe Putney case is not about is what I think is far more important, is how do the federal antitrust laws deal with the fact that the background environment is highly distorted through regulation? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think the, um, the, the bigger questions really have to do with, uh, you know, how do we do antitrust in this, in this highly regulated and more highly regulated uh, industry? Um, uh, one one thing that I I don't know enough about this particular case to, to s say much about it, but one area where we need more regulation rather than less I think is is in antitrust and health insure insurance at the state level. So there are um, federal exemptions to to um, antitrust uh, for uh, health entities and. Um, you know, I think I think those need to be scrapped, and I think um, you know we can't rely on state law to get us there. If you look at um, the levels of concentration in health insurance companies across states, 
it's there the the concentration levels are much higher much higher than any level that would trigger some sort of investigation and so we we need to fix that um, we need to fix that and so I think we need to be more rigorous in this area rather than less um, and and another thing that has to happen which I think is the hardest piece of this puzzle is that we need to fund the agencies um, that do that kind of work. So I think one of the reasons why state regulation of antitrust is not working very well is just that there's so many needs of states at this point and so little revenue that it's it's very it's hard to make it a priority. Um, and then there's you know the special interest pushback, um, which makes it makes it difficult. So I think um, going forward, antitrust is going to be. And with the affordable, or the accountable care organizations also coming in, we're going to have to think about um, how that's going to impact market power and how to deal with, with um, the the issues that I think are are, are coming down the pipeline along those fronts. Well, let, let me just add one thing about health insurance, and I've sort of reached a point in my career in health law and policy where I like to be simple and blunt. So forgive me. Um, health insurance uh, today is at an, a point of severe identity crisis bordering on the existential. Um, I think of health insurance as, health insurers today are kind of like AT&T after it got stripped of the baby bells and the parts of telephones that people actually used. And it, health insurers don't really know what they are or want to become. Um, they don't do a whole lot of insurance right now in the sense of risk bearing. Um, most health insurers um, are claims administrators, either for employers who self-insure or for government programs. Um, there's a few who actually bear insurance risk, but they're kind of outside the health insurance mainstream. So what are health insurers going to be in the future? Um, are they going to be uh, price brokerages? Um, and negotiators? Are they going to be custodians of your personal health records? Are they going to be um, wellness coaches to American business? Um, we don't know yet. Um, are they simply going to continue to be claims processors? Which they do fine. I mean, more power to them. They're good at that. They have a lot of experience. They do it quite well. Um, but I think that you know, when we talk about health insurance in this country, we really don't know what we're talking about. And a lot of the large health insurers really don't know what they're going to become. Professors. Any other questions from the audience? I had one question uh, for the panelists. Getting back to this idea about the inability uh, for, of the government to to bargain in a number of contexts, um, both uh, Kathy and Bill, you touched on this. Um, I'm wondering what you think the implications will be of the inability of the federal government to uh, bargain with respect to pharmaceutical prices. And the implication as it would affect the implementation of PPAC. I've been wrong on this one. I mean, this is interesting. I mean, I think overall my predictive track record is pretty good. I was totally wrong on this. I figured in the 2008 election cycle, there would be bipartisan agreement that some level of um, administered pricing was appropriate for pharmaceuticals, and it didn't happen. Um, so I, I'm, I'm waiting for, for this to kind of play out a little bit and see how um, the consumer side shifts. I mean, I think that by and large pharmaceutical companies had a period in the 1990s into the 2000s when they figured that um, their traditional assurances of payment were jeopardized either by powerful buyers such as health insurers um, or by government and they started going directly to consumers and in other ways buying up their distribution networks through pharmacy benefit managers and the like. And I think they managed, whatever those strategies were, they were um, successful for a decade. Um, but there's a whole bunch of both innovation pressure and pricing pressure today and I don't know where we're going to get. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is outside of my topic here, but on the innovation pressure, that's very real. Almost all of these companies are facing patent cliffs. Um, Sanofi uh, is on their oncology division is going to go from two multi-billion dollar blockbusters at the end of 14 to eight products that will have a revenue of a half a billion dollars each. So all of that price pressure is changing, and the innovation pipeline 
is particularly desperate, particularly given the last five years of lack of um, funding for innovation because of the financial crisis. Um, and that's going to be hitting the same time that the, governor's, the government's going to be taking on more of that burden. So um, it's interesting. Prices are going to come down, I think, just as a result of things have nothing to do with the Affordable Care Act. Very interesting timing. And of course, this is uh, quite the year if you're a law student for following the Supreme Court in healthcare. There's my, at my last count eight cases before the court that, in some sense, touch on healthcare, and I've never seen anything close to this. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe it's just <laughs> ra random cycles of sunspots, but it'll make for some interesting opinions. Uh, I, I'll just make two quick comments on the pharmaceutical issue. Um, I, I worry about innovation in the sense that uh, as states um, lock down their essential benefits and they get very specific about preventative services that are covered or particular ways in which um, uh, particular benefits that have to be provided in these contracts that we could get, it might be very you know, difficult to change those lists. And um, you know, so now I think pharmaceuticals have to start thinking about the cost of you know getting on to 50 day, different states' lists of essential benefits um, to the extent they get that specific. Um, another issue that I think is going to have a big impact in this area is um, the the recent uh, litigation on the or reg regulation legislation on the question of um, uh, generics um, and. Uh, you know, in, in the old world, the very recent old world, it used to be that um, th the brand name drugs could pay the generics to delay entry into the markets. Um, so they would just settle and uh, for some amount and the, the brand name would pay the generic to stay off the market. And those have been, I think that's over, right? Well, this, that's the Watson Pharmaceutical case in, in the Supreme Court right now. Yeah, so. so those have been the, um, you know, those are on their way, you know, to being challenged or, or finished. and. Um, and that I think is is um, is going to have some impact on um, you know faster entry of generics and and to the extent that generics are pushed by um, health insurance companies I think it could have a, um, some impact on cost. Well, and again, this is a little bit of a digression, but the other part of the Affordable Care Act that's relevant is the um, generic biologics pathway for approval for Food and Drug Administration. Biologics are where the dollars are. That's where everything is very expensive. And the Affordable Care Act creates a pathway for a generic biologic to enter the market, although even if the regulations are implemented to perfection, it is not an easy road and one that most companies are not going to get into, including the, the exclusivity period that was compromised. Um, the, the people, um, the generic backers are quite upset, actually, with the White House for agreeing to that compromise in the Affordable Care Act. So um, the pressure on the big dollar drugs, which are biologics, um, is a long way away because of generics. Questions? I was asked to finish 10 minutes early, and I believe I have accomplished that task. <laughs>